events happening where we're doing the earthquake things and the tornadoes and not only weather but other sorts of disasters. And this is obviously important globally. And so uh, we really have to look at this from sort of the local and global perspectives. And lots and lots of folks need to be tuned in to uh, this area. Our most recent um, NSF proposal, which actually is under consideration right now, is in the biological environmental climate area. And we are particularly uh, looking at uh, working very tightly with some of the rural and remote um, uh, long-term environmental sites. And also on the education side, it's really sort of from birth to death that we have to know a lot more about things like uh, what's happening in the environmental area, what's happening with climate change, all the way from kids in the cave, uh, going forward space through citizen scientists, et cetera. Very important audience here are decision makers. We need to be able to take some of these great visualization tools and we need to be able to take those to uh, uh, council meetings, community meetings. I mean, a lot of folks need this kind of data support to be able to make good decisions. And I think we're a long ways away yet from having figured that out. We hope to do a little piece of cyber infrastructure work that will work with field laboratories as well as then try to take that um, more appropriately into the education space. We have something called the Western Hemisphere Initiative. We're working with Mexico, a number of countries in Latin America, and the Caribbean. Uh, basically trying to get better connections between and among higher ed institutions as well as develop uh, and build upon applications that we have here. Uh, obviously, we have to deal with things like language and culture and adaptations and all that kind of stuff. And so our Western Hemisphere Initiative is, is focused in that area. University of Costa Rica uh, is a lead implementing partner for us. Uh, we have a number of research laboratories in the Caribbean and in Latin America where we have partners between our universities here and down there. So it has both a research and education focus. Uh, Chinese distance education. Um, um, I have Our first NSF project had a Chinese component that was focused on distance education and digital libraries. Um, I've been on teams a couple of times going over with the advanced networking folks from Internet2. And I'm the one who deals with applications and uh, what are you going to do to get to the 800 million rural farmer gardeners in China. Uh, I mean, the, the scale and the scope of the, the kinds of educational issues that you're dealing with in China are absolutely huge. We just had a visit last week from a delegation <coughs> from China uh, from the largest distance education serving operation in the world. Um, and there, it's very, very interesting. We're using everything from high performance networking to loudspeakers in villages and very interesting, you know, mixes of things. So uh, this is one we continue to work on. Uh, last week I was in South Africa and those of you who are familiar with the African continent and some of the countries, Africa is not a country, it's many countries with many different kinds of circumstances and conditions. <laughs> And uh, we've been looking along with the National Association of State Universities and Land Grant Colleges at how we can link up some of our U.S. universities and African higher education institutions to kind of move us along in this area, both research and education. Okay, innovation. This is kind of the space where we try to live. This is really our primary mission and mandate is our members come together and um, we have a task force that has different groups working under it, but we try to advance the technology just like Internet 2. Many of our folks are also actively involved in the Internet 2 space as well as other organizations and groups. Um, and we try to, to focus on uh, the technology kinds of opportunities uh, things we need to do, how we need to do it, what we're learning about educational effectiveness and how the technologies can help us. Uh, the same is true with respect to methodologies. And our just completed MSM project looks a lot at educational effectiveness. What was and what wasn't important? I mean, is high definition important for teaching and learning? Um, uh, one of the things we learned early on in some of our work um, with NSF and the Educational 
effectiveness space was how important high quality audio is. Now that's not a new finding. Um, if you go back, I, I come out originally of a background as a television producer, worked with sound and sight, video and audio uh, for a lot of years. And so we knew that in the early days of education, that high uh, quality audio was absolutely critical. But there are a lot of those kinds of questions in which we really haven't dealt terribly well yet. Uh, we also work closely with the Sloan Foundation. They have a consortium somewhat like ours. We are officially partnered. And we do a lot of joint activities. We're talking about the virtual world, so you're talking about Second Life, you're talking about some of the kinds of teaching and learning applications. We work very closely with them. They're on our board of directors, and I'm on their board of directors, so we do that kind of shit. Digital infrastructure, there are two pieces to this. Um, one is access. Access, access, access. We don't have access. I don't know if all of you have. Everything you want is your own house. I don't. <laughs> And now we're mobile and people are learning everywhere and we're seeing that even on campus we're blending so people uh, aren't going to campuses for nearly as much as they used to go and they're doing many more of their, their you know, things outside of the campus level. We are also an advocate for rural broadband. Um, I spend some time in Washington um, kind of carrying forward the message that we have lots of folks in rural, remote, and underserved areas and we're a long, long way from having uh, uh, what we really need there. We work with uh, minority serving institutions. We do a lot of work with the tribal colleges, with the historically black colleges and universities, uh, and the constituents who really, you know, in many ways are still back in an earlier generation of this, and the teaching and learning agenda is critical. Digital repositories, we're working on digital library kinds of issues and everything that's associated with that. That's where the applications, the middleware, the, all of that kind of piece is very important. And um, I won't go any further than that. There are more slides here. These will be up on my website. But those are our um, overarching uh, items. I, the one last thing I would say about disasters, we got very heavily involved in disaster issues during the hurricanes. and. Um, as most of you know, most of the uh, networking was gone. <laughs> and so we sent teams out. We've been doing a lot of research with um, wireless, with satellite, with hybrid networking, Internet 2 at the core, but then we've had private sector partners in satellite space and the wireless space. And so we sent teams out with generators and water and all kinds of stuff and went down and spent quite a period of time in the Gulf, first putting universities back up and then um, working almost little internet cafe kinds of operations. Um, and since then, we've really gotten very heavily involved along with the Sloan Foundation in some of those things that we need to be doing around uh, disaster prevention and recovery. Um, Jennifer, that's probably more than 10 minutes, but that's a real quick flyover of some of the things we're involved with. I'd be happy to answer questions, hear comments. Some of you are probably from institutions that are ADEC <coughs> members, and others of you have never heard of us. How many members do you have? We have about 65. Uh, the, this organization, start, we're a 501c3, I should have said that originally, made up of uh, uh, public universities at the core. We're, we really grow out of the National Association of State Universities, land grant colleges. The land grant institutions were a very heavy base for us because they had the extension, the outreach. We've always worked in those universities, no matter what the technologies were, in terms of bringing it into other communities. So uh, that was kind of the original natural base for the organization. We now are growing. Uh, particularly with respect to international affiliates. We have a lot of universities who are joining around the world in uh, the affiliate status. I'm in kind of interested in your disaster planning. We've been working on pandemic planning. Yeah. Uh, and there's been a lot of questions about the viability of distance education in, in, in that case. Have you done any work on that? Oh, yeah. In fact, this is where uh, those of you who are familiar with what happened in the, the hurricanes, um, the Sloan Foundation put up considerable money to rather rapidly help us mount um, the students that were all displaced in the Gulf. 
uh, were offered up to nine hours of uh, free credit from anywhere. They were, you know, everybody lot went home, some went to different spaces, places. We learned a tremendous amount about uh, what worked and what didn't work. We did a lot of the technology work in ADAC and Sloan, uh, the Sloan Consortium put a lot of that together. I am totally convinced, we've been holding meetings in Washington, we've looked at this every which way. I'm totally convinced that we pretty much need to have all faculty be very facile going forward with the online tools, et cetera. And um, there have been, I've attended some of the disaster sessions here. People need to be paired with people outside the immediate area. Uh, there's a whole host of things that I think is pretty clear. Now, if you're going to talk about a pandemic, Actually, Sloan had a number of us go through kind of a workshop in the, in the health area with Johns Hopkins. The considerations there are going to be different than, say, the Virginia Tech situation or the hurricane or a tornado. The most likely, uh, the highest risk comes from weather-related disasters. So those, everybody needs to really be heavily prepared. The pandemic is probably not going to hit everybody once. If that happens, it's going to probably be a rolling kind of thing. You may get people who are uh, stuck on campus, you know. So the technology and the teaching, learning, distance ed parts of these are different depending on what kind of a disaster it is. But um, uh, without question, the, the distance learning, the, the uh, technology definitely has a role. We've got one big problem in all of this, which we don't talk too much about, which is power. And, looking at like some of the weather kinds of pieces. I mean, we just loaded generators up and took them down into the Gulf and, and um, you know, worked off that. But there are a whole lot of power questions that I think will soon in the disaster area couple with the other technologies. Other questions, comments, ideas? Yes. Yeah, that's one question. You had uh, so much experience with the uh, working distance learning environment. How do you win over the time difference? That's a really good question. That's one of the reasons why, if you're going to look at global science and education, synchronous learning is not your total answer. Uh, you have to look at asynchronous, and asynchronous is um, where most of it is. I, I have taught an experimental course for about four years. I'm a professor in journalism, communication, that kind of thing, along with my real job, which is ADEC. Uh, but we ran a class where we said, basically, anybody can come to this class any way you want to. You can be here face to face. You can come in. We had all the technology available. That class happened to be at 7 o'clock on Monday night running for three hours. Well, if you were in Japan or if you were in, we had people everywhere. Uh, we had people in the military. We had people in, um, but the folks that wanted to do it that were not in our time frame really had to want to do it. They had to be motivated learners to do that kind of synchronous learning. We also had everything you know, available. You did not have to come to class. That was part of our... Now, some part essentially requires synchronous. It doesn't have to be the whole course, but mm -hmm. some modules have to be synchronous, right? There. Um, I don't think so. Not In fact, you can run very, very good courses that don't have to be synchronous. The more mature your learners, this is always true. If you've got mature learners who want to learn, um, you don't have to do nearly as many things to motivate learners, to keep them on track, do all that kind of thing. Synchronous is wonderful, though, for helping people stay on track. To take a check of where are we. Um, we still got a lot to learn about the getting the warmth into you know, these. We, we don't have that problem solved. Television is a cold medium. Video is a cold medium. Voice carries the meaning. Um, if, if I had a preference, I would want to have the high quality audio and really good graphics and simulations and animations. I wouldn't worry too much about whether somebody saw me or not after they knew what I looked like. There are those kinds of details. We really have to be good research to help us. You, but you don't have their thousands and thousands and thousands of people doing very well in distance ed without the synchronous at all. It's all a matter of what can you afford, what you have available, how much do you want to learn. Um, and if you've got nothing, <laughs> uh, you know, whatever you can get. Yeah, have you undertaken any uh, formal study to validate what you have said? 
like comparing synchronous, uh, asynchronous, and same course talking. Yeah. Oh, there's research up the kazoo okay. and this comparison stuff. And frankly, these comparison pieces are not valid anyway, whether you do the comparisons of face-to-face. -face. And part of that is, I mean, you have to control all variables, which becomes almost impossible. But the one thing that comes out of almost all of the comparison studies done is that distance learning is as good or maybe a little better than face-to-face -face learning. And that comes, I think, not so much from uh, and, and you could say that the, syn the synchronous has some other issues with it, so I don't want to get it too complicated. But some of that actually comes from uh, uh, the, uh, the early adopters have tended to get into the use of the technologies and the planning, and a lot of people are not necessarily in face-to-face -face learning, doing the kind of preparation, et cetera. You have to work harder when you have fewer tools, fewer rich tools available. So, I think it's really that planning, that that dedication to trying to get a good teaching. A good teacher is going to try to help somebody learn, and that's absolutely critical. I think my time is. Oh, you've been wonderful. So let's uh, thank Jenny for taking the time to join us. By uh, email, uh, you can find that on the website. If you uh, have any ideas, want to make contact, whatever, you can reach out to me. That's what I many many different places all the time that I uh, answer my email. <laughs> and I hope we can stay uh, to continue the relationship between the teaching and learning student and I think there's a lot of uh, common intersect points there. So thanks, Janet. Thank you for I'm great. sorry to run off. But thank I you for being two places at once. Ours was the second on the to, to rise <laughs> to the forefront. So thank you. Okay. So next up. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, thank you all. Just by a quick show of hands, how many of you were in the session this morning on finding collaborators worldwide? Oh, wow. A lot fewer than I expected, actually. Um, okay, so what, what we thought we'd do here is for this piece of it, uh, James Worley, who's in the audience here, and I would like to just tell you a little bit about this new tool. So I don't want to take too much time for it, but since there are quite a few of you who haven't seen it, let me go ahead and pull up uh, some slides here, and we will tell you a little bit more about it. Short version. We were assuming all of the hands would go up, and you always say, oh, God, stop talking about it, but you haven't seen it, so that's okay. okay. Stop talking. There was, unfortunately, a back-to-back uh, performing arts yes. kind of compelling session as well, and I have a hunch we... And we, we know many of you went to that instead, and that's okay, that's okay. That's why we're covering it again here. So, um, James, do you want to come up here, or are you just going to speak from the table there? There's room right here. So, James Worley is co-chair of the Internet 2 K-20 initiative, and James and I have been teaming up on this project to develop a new social networking tool to connect uh, people around use of advanced networking applications for teaching and learning. So um, the need here, as we see it, is basically this. I don't know how many of you have heard this before, but we sort of constantly get the question, how do I find the other end? Where do I find a collaboration site around this particular discipline or application? We have 87 high performance networks around the world. We have over 50,000 sites in the US alone that are connected to Internet 2. But few people know how to find these collaboration sites. So the solution to date has been a little haphazard. You meet people at a conference and you kind of have that, that uh, in-person networking. Or maybe you email uh, uh, the director of a national research and education network abroad and try to figure out what site's connected or who they might be able to collaborate with. But it's not a very um, convenient approach. It's not one that is scalable. It's not one that we can sort of readily hand off to a user community. So we kind of consider this the holy grail. Um, how to find collaborating partners um, to really have success in scalability of applications and collaborations. So we had some goals here for this system. Um, and I can talk through them unless you want to, to do that. So, the goals for MUSE, which is the name of the new system, are to connect people with similar interests around advanced networking applications 
encourage collaboration, facilitate resource sharing and discovery, and introduce new communities to the advanced networking community and applications. Um, do you want to talk to this or? Yeah, the, uh, how many of you, just to show hands, are familiar with the, the, the current My K20 environment? So really, this was this was the previews effort to to form a uh, you know, social network or online community around applications, and it, it did have some some limitations. Um, as soon as somebody would enter in their you know their personal profile information or, or a description of a project, there there, was, there really wasn't any compelling reason to come back and, and, and perhaps update it or continue to uh, you know, contribute to that description. So it quickly became obsolete and out of date. And, and, and we all know when, when you're hungry for information, the last thing you want is something that you get excited about and you realize that it's dead. So uh, a couple other limitations that we discovered pretty quickly with the systems. People were also really hungry for, once they found somebody, they wanted to figure out, well, how can I, how can I get in touch with this person? How can I communicate? Uh, the system didn't really facilitate that beyond just putting a, a phone number or uh, you know an email address, uh, and it did. It did. We, we sort of built the MyK20 system as a as a as a resource that was designed to serve uh, folks specifically in the K20 initiative, uh, as well as just, just so just within the United States. So, I guess from the from my perspective at, at Magpie, we're a regional organization. We serve three states, and I was getting a request from a lot of our member community. We need a regional database. We love my K20 and what James has done, and this this wonderful national database. But we want something a little bit smaller in scale for our faculty and our teachers either because they were intimidated about posting a project for the, the world to see, or because they wanted to really just be able to have sort of a regional view of what's happening uh, in our tri-state area. But the challenges with that were that we didn't want to compete with the national database. We didn't want folks in our community having to go to both the regional site and the national site, because that's a lot of sites to remember. You know how many sites we all have and different passwords, and it's sort of, not the optimal way to uh, share this kind of information. So we actually teamed up, and that was about a year and a half ago, and I came to James and said, look, I'm, I'm getting this request. I can't deny it any longer. You know, we're going to do something regionally. And James said, well, great, we're going to do something nationally. Let's do it together. So we, we have worked together to develop this tool with a very specific goal of enabling um, not all, not just all the wonderful goals we outlined earlier, but also this really key aspect, at least in my mind, of the regionalization component. So we should probably breeze through these a little bit quickly. Yeah. You want to just go to the demo? Yeah, let's go to the demo. All right, you all can read these later. But so we had an ideology, web 2.0, blah blah blah, social networking, blah blah blah, <laughs> tagging. It's all good. We don't even care about that side. We thank Internet2 for their support because they are hosting this system on their server. Um, they've been really great. Um, Absolutely. We could have done it without the support of Internet2 to, to technically get the thing. Hey, when edit, edit, whenever anybody steps up and says, we'd like to advance some database efforts, we're like, <laughs> you're here, crazy. Here's the server <laughs> space. Yeah. You're crazy. So here's the big reveal. <laughs> <laughs> or did you want to go live? Oh, uh, well, I don't know. It's probably, 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 probably. Yeah. Why don't we Why don't we not go live? If you If you missed the live demo this morning, you can always go and check out the netcast archives. Um, this is the the overall news interface. This is the regional interface. So I think, again, I don't mean to, to sort of harp on this, but this is something that's pretty exciting for us at Magpie is that we developed this way to very quickly jump back and forth between the Muse global view and the Magpie regional view. So right now, you're sort of seeing the Magpie regional thing, and all you have to do is click up here to see everything in Muse. So it kind of gives you this regional bubble. We're not going to do the live demo. We told you why. A lot of you probably know this challenge as well. You've got a new faculty member 
who knows nothing about internet too. And you have to educate your faculty, and it's not like a, a one-off process. It's an ongoing educational outreach uh, for, I think, every institution that wants to really see success in use of advanced applications. So what we've also developed as part of the system is something called Getting Started Guides. And we didn't really talk about that this, this morning. Did no, we? we didn't. That, that slide was deleted, so we didn't We missed it. Yeah, so you all are getting the, the Getting Started Guide uh, uh, preview. but. These are really targeted for specific communities within K-20, and you see the communities here. And each Getting Started Guide is led by a community member of that community. So you get sort of a personalized view. We'll show you the screenshot here. So Robert Musgrove from Pine Technical College in Minnesota helped to write this one. It's tailored for that community. It talks about the benefits and implications specific to that community projects of interest to that community, ways you can get involved and find others within, say, a two-year community college um, uh, arena. So we think that's pretty cool, too. There's also an organization list that shows you all the different organizations that are in the system, and we'll skip all this. How do you get involved? So if you've liked this little bit that you've seen here, uh, we want to encourage you to create an account in the system. We're considering this here at Internet2 uh, member meeting our soft launch, so do be gentle. Um, we will have our beta launch toward the end of October or so. And um, think about whether or not Muse is something that you could use in your community or in your region, and whether you might want to have your own regional site. We'd love to have takers on that. So that's the URL. And what else do you want to add, James? Um, just, just if you do end up there, I would, I would recommend you know, as of today, looking at it in Firefox. So we just, one of the things we're doing is trying to sort out browser compatibility. So, uh, you, you may have more success with the Firefox, but you know, in short order, we should have it working in, in all the major browsers. Great point. <laughs> Save yourself a little bit of frustration. So that's news, and we hope that you all will uh, take a look and, and tell us your feedback about it. Since you're running the meeting, I would like on behalf of this community to thank both of you and, and Tim for the work that you put into this. Thank you. And Anne mentions Tim, who we did not get any airtime to today. My apologies, Tim, for that. Three options for the last two days. <laughs> okay. For those of you who missed this morning, Tim Boundy is from Janet, which is an organization in the UK that runs a centralized video conferencing and collaboration service, and has also just launched Janet Collaborate, which is a similar social networking tool for the UK community. Um, so check out the, the Netcast archive, because Tim, Tim had a great demo that he gave this morning as well. Next up, we will transition from social networking tools to uh, live uh, orchestral performances over Internet 2, and we'll hear from Ed Cameron, who's the VP of Marketing for the Philadelphia Orchestra. I'm going to try not to use the mics. We have natural sound, if that's okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for uh, inviting me, Jennifer and Ann, to talk this morning just a little bit. I don't know if they, how many of you saw the presentation this morning? Great. Uh, I wanted to give you a brief, brief idea. I know a lot of people are wanting the Philadelphia Orchestra Internet 2 connection, connection. Uh, the real connection there is the Philadelphia Orchestra uh, is in its infancy in exploring technologies to get the music that we make in the concert hall out of the concert hall into the world. Uh, the whole world of media has changed dramatically. Orchestras now have a role in educating people about music. Uh, arts education, as you know, is in the toilet in America. Uh, and music education is probably the root bottom of and we're finding ourselves having to do more to engage adults with music and definitely children. And our global concert series, which if you haven't seen our little brochure, we're really good at making brochures for uh, It's available at the information desk. We have a, a stack here. It's really designed to deliver live concerts with interactive components, pre-concert, intermission, and post-concerts through Internet2 to, to universities who, uh, who would like to share that with their students, with their community, 
uh, whatever purpose that they really see fit. Uh, it's been a real learning experience for us. Jennifer and, and her folks at Magpie and, and Greg have just been incredible and Ann. Uh, we, you know, this conference is the first one we've ever attended and we're learning a lot and uh, it's, it's amazing the work that you guys are doing. It's, it's just amazing to me. Um, so what you'll see in this little brochure is that we're doing a series of concerts uh, that people can pick up uh, on the internet and we're looking for partners. We're also looking for a lot of learning. One of our goals is once we get our feet wet, is to develop content that goes directly to different levels. K through 12 is of real interest to us. And we have heard a lot of folks out there in the US, once we announce this, come forward and say, we want to get you in, 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 in our school. We're, we're seeing some issues that we're having to deal with in terms of technical stuff. But most importantly, we don't necessarily have the kind of curriculum that takes advantage of internet too going in, into school systems. We do a lot of education programs, but they're designed for kids face to face or kids sitting in a concert hall, not necessarily kids on the other side of an internet two connection. So we, are, and the reason I really want to be is to ask for your help. Um, you know, we, we're trying to build relationships uh, with folks who not only help us with internet two transmissions, but help, help us be that way that we can do a little better curriculum and things like that. So that's kind of what I wanted to say this morning. I'm being brief. Um, you can check this out. Uh, it has our contact information. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can take no? Yes. Yes. Uh, the scope of your audience. Are, are you interested at all in working with libraries, perhaps, to with, I'm sorry, uh, public libraries, perhaps, to be interested in that? We, we, we are. We're really open. We're in the learning phase. So we're interested in working with anyone who wants to deliver high quality classical <coughs> music to people. Any age, any venue. Uh, we're struggling a little bit with, we have, there's a lot of uh, variables at play at, in our organization and we're into quality. The Philadelphia Orchestra is one of the world's greatest orchestras. And the sound of the Philadelphia Orchestra is like sacred. So when we deliver content by Internet 2, it's really important that that quality be there. So we're kind of struggling with that a little bit, to be very honest, about where is the bar? Right now the bar is right here. And you know, we're going to try to keep it as close to there as possible. So that when we bring up libraries, it's a question of do they have what it takes to, to do that? They absolutely are interested. Yes? Well, the fact that you're selling your bar somewhere, I'm wondering, are you interested in video conferences? Are we interested in video conferencing? Yes. Have you tried? We have, we have done some master work, uh, master classes. In fact, we did an event today with. Uh, yeah, with Polyclon machine. We did a master class between Manhattan School of Music and the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia. Um, so we're start. We're we're really in the stage we're where we're trying different things. We've we experimented with DBT. DBT. Yes. DBT. Yes. And. Um, MPEG-2, so we're, we're really just trying different things and seeing which works for different applications and for different venues. We are spending a lot of time, we, we understand we did a lot of research, the interactivity is really important. And we're trying to figure out ways in which to deliver that to a lot of people all at the same time. Um, and if you want to deliver any of your content from the UK, to the schools in the UK, I'm sure you get some sense there. Great, that's great, thank you. I can also put you in contact with two orchestras in the UK who are doing it already, you might be able to ask the LSO and Yeah, LSO and Beach and Scottish. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Yes, sir. I'm not really at the end of the Symphony Works conference a year ago as well, and I don't remember one concern they have with the quality. Is that a concern that's competent? Are you, how are you dealing with that kind of passages? Um, we've done, we're lucky that our musicians in Philadelphia have been incredibly flexible. I think they have in their DNA as an organization, we've done a lot of creative things in the past. That's part of what's allowed us to do that. The actual copyright issues are, you want to address how we're doing it. We're investigating what the best way to deal with it. I mean, when we go out to a venue that says that they want the transmission, that's easy because they have to sign an artistic rider that prevents them from copying the data. Now, 
with that said, Internet 2 is a pretty open community, and there is the issue that people could get onto the um, stream without us necessarily knowing that. So we're looking at some software solutions that might address that. We're in early conversations with Internet 2 to see if they could help us on that side. Yeah, we're willing to take risks, though, right now. Well, um, until you get your hand slapped by somebody, you know, that's, that's it. But if you, if you can resolve them, I, I think there are others that would be very interested in participating, so I encourage you. As soon as you can figure that out, um, that's going to be important. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ed and Tish, for joining us and uh, giving a little update here. So next up, we will transition to our virtual worlds uh, agenda items. And uh, as we mentioned uh, earlier, there's been a lot of uh, enthusiasm about uh, virtual worlds and Second Life for Education in the teaching and learning space, and we're excited to be pursuing that. And Doyle is here to give us an update on the possibility of some teaching and learning space in virtual worlds. So Anne, do you want to take the mic or are you going to use natural audio too? Natural audio. All right. <laughs> um, so I don't know how many of you participated, maybe a quick show of hands, in the uh, conference call that we called this summer and then the follow-up um, field trip to um, Second Life. So we had a, a, a um, engaging, sometimes amusing, I believe I crashed my avatar right in the middle of the meeting. Um, but we had fun and, and really are trying to bring together what we heard from you, which is there's a really strong interest in the teaching and learning online community in how to use virtual worlds for effectively and educational purposes. And one of the things that came up in the last conversation we had about this is that the New Media um, Center Consortium is very much in this space and might be interesting to partner with. So uh, my to-do was to follow up on that. My update is very brief, but I did have a um, long and pretty wonderful conversation with Larry Johnson, um, the head of the New Media Center Consortium. And he would love to lease us a small parcel of land, small being the operative word, because um, I had to figure out where to find the uh, <coughs> rent from my budget. So, but we are, in fact, going to set up a small parcel of land for us, the teaching and learning folks here at Internet2, on a new media center educational island and on that island, we will, by being uh, land renters, have access to their meeting facili facilities, classroom space, a, a whole center of the island that will be <coughs> educational people rather than gaming people, so that we've got a, what I would call a safe space to experiment and continue what Jennifer and Marty have really identified as one of the highly um, active, interested uh, topic matters within this group. So we will keep you apprised. Probably our <coughs> next meeting that we'll have online will be in Second Life to tell all of you where that space is, help you all get there. And um, yes, as I recall, Ruthie, you were dancing. It's <laughs> fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> She, yeah, you, you had a lively avatar in my recollection, and um, I, as did I. So, so w without further ado, oh, okay. Oh, okay. okay. Well, actually, let's. I want to thank you, Anne, for taking this up with your colleagues at Internet Two and with the New Media Consortium and leading this charge and getting us a safe space. So, thank you. <laughs> sure. um, is she now a land baron? Oh, you know, I was going to ask her if she was a slumlord, a virtual slumlord. But is it available? Yeah. yeah, he he said he could have it set up for us in about a week. In the, there, there he is. Um, our colleagues, um, uh, Ben Feynman and George, who in a 
He's here online. Yes. Okay. Exactly. George Brett, who has worked with this group before, have both said they would be happy to work with me um, to make sure, and and Lori, who we're about to hear from, to make sure that this space is. I said, you know, can any of you help me with some interior decorating? <laughs> I don't want it to be a totally bland parcel. So we'll somehow set that, create that uh, environment to be a learning friendly space. And I think it'll be a fun adventure. Would you like to introduce Lori? Do you want me to introduce Lori? You're more than welcome. That would be great. All right. So I have the fun of having a team of colleagues, uh, George Brett being one of them, Ben Feynman being one of them, Lori Kirkmeyer being one of them. Lori uh, works both with the technology team at Internet2. He also works with Merritt, the Magpie counterpart who um, serves the state of Michigan in combination with the state of Ohio. There's actually a consortium between Ohio and Michigan. Um, so he has some very interesting perspectives and has worked in the teaching and learning space, both in higher ed and in the K-12 um, community college library arena through his role at Merritt. So we asked him if he might come today, and he graciously said yes. He actually very quickly said yes, bless his heart, um, that he might come and give us another angle perspective from what he has seen on educational, um, sort of environments within uh, Second Life. And so please, let's uh, give a warm welcome to my colleague, Lori Kirkmeyer. Okay, well, let me try and get my machine visible. See how this works. So one thing to say about Second Life and all of these virtual worlds is that you need plenty of time. <laughs> It's amazing. You can uh, really uh, spend an inordinate amount of time uh, in these worlds. And uh, time that I don't usually have. <laughs> so, okay, so let's do that. Fingers crossed. The machine is not correct in the world. That is not. So, yes, what I want to do is talk a little bit about uh, Second Life, uh, how I've been playing with it uh, and looking at it from the K-12 perspective. Randy was involved in a demonstration with Merritt. Uh, Jim Moran was sitting at the back of the room. He's, he's maybe disappeared. Why is this running water time? I don't know. Anyway, we did a demonstration over the early summer in, in April. April with folks up in Traverse City, Michigan. We had Randy come in by as a Second Life character but also as a uh, uh, video conference as well. Uh, H2K video conference. <laughs> What's happening? Where is it? Let me see. Ah, there we go. Right. Okay. That looks good enough. It's a little stretch here. <laughs> It'll loop. It'll loop. So it looks good for you guys, I think. So. All right. Wow. OK, quickly. Because what I'd like to do is talk a, a few slides um, and then really do uh, some two demonstrations if we can. One is, um, uh, uh, the, we'll finish up with Second Life, but we're going to start with Quark Forums. If any of you were at the spring meeting, we, there was a virtual worlds 
done a presentation with, which Ben and George gave, uh, Ben uh, Ben Feynman uh, was the uh, convener or the, anyway. Uh, and uh, one of the presentations was uh, clock forums, and so that's a, a different private, well, and again, another private virtual world that you can subscribe, you can uh, get a membership to and subscribe. So let me just move through these very quickly. Uh, so I think massively multi multiplayer, multi-user, immersive virtual worlds is, I think Jim actually came up with that line, but, it, but that's what it describes it. Uh, uh, these things are huge online games, uh, online uh, worlds, uh, where people exist for, uh, I think a lot of people really do have uh, a long second life where they, they spend more time doing this than the real world. Why would, some of the things that are going on in second life, that's for sure. Uh, by Linda Research, uh, the heritage in, is in World of Warcraft, another, an EverQuest. Um, and it is a completely accessible virtual world. You can you start off with a sort of a blank canvas on an island, and you can build incredible structures and build cars, planes, uh, you name it, you can do it. Uh, I don't want to think about what you can do in some parts of Second Life, but uh, but then that's the both the pluses and the minuses of it. It's a, it can be a, unless you can establish a, an island where you have constrained entry. There, it is really is the wild west of. Uh, uh, the online worlds. Uh, there are places where you can carry guns, and you get to some places where it says no guns allowed in here, and you would if you are. But anyway, <laughs> so there's. Um, uh, I'm glad that we have a space that uh, is going to be usable in a constrained way. Um, so I threw this up here because if you have not seen this episode, go online, <laughs> type in South Park. War, World of Warcraft and watch this episode because it is it, it is brilliant in terms of you have to if you don't mind a South Park is somewhat edgy in terms of its humor uh, but this is the South Park characters in their Second Life lives uh, sorry World of Warcraft lives World of Warcraft. but um, it's a very good episode and shows the uh, uh, how uh, I mean I think as I say the, the one can get very sucked into this. I think kids can get sucked into this to a degree where it is socially detrimental to them. But uh, uh, so there are degrees of usage of this. So Jim found this. Uh, this Sega Golden Linden Labs is to create a world like Meta Universe from uh, a user defined world of general use in which people can interact, play, do business, and otherwise communicate. And uh, they certainly do that with uh, great abandon. Um, so this is uh, the sorts of numbers that we're talking about. You know, the last uh, 60 days, they had over 1 million people log in. Uh, total residents, just on uh, 9 million. Uh, last night, I think, uh, well, actually, yes, this was um, at uh, about 10 p.m. or uh, this was or 7 p.m. There were uh, 1. Uh, 36,000 people logged last night. And there is a real economy. There's a real exchange rate. You basically buy Linden dollars. You you go to an exchange money, and you uh, real you have, you you have to put money into an account, and, and then you can exchange it with Linden dollars, and, and they are a currency that you buy and sell things with. Um, so certainly, uh, there is a great way to socially social networking uh, and collaboration in a, at a distance. Uh, you have uh, companies like IBM uh, uh, who have an office complex where IBM is such a distributed company around the world, they really use Second Life to come together as employees and, and, uh, they, and also they meet with customers and are able to really um, uh, use, a, have a very meaningful collaborative experience uh, which brings this huge company of uh, employees together. Um, Laurie? Linda Dollars, by the way, is where I got stuck with our accounting department. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you did. I'm sure you did. Yeah. Laurie, they're, they're actually, uh, some of the universities are using Second Life for recruiting, a recruiting yes, tool yes. as well. Absolutely. We'll try and get that. How much time do we have left? Because I know we're really... You, okay. have 10 minutes. Right? 10 minutes? Sure. Oh, we're going to do 5 minutes. Okay. 5 minutes of, uh, so I'm going to just go to the demo. So, uh, demos. So, let's see do this. Okay. We're going to go straight over to Quark Forums, which is a much 
if you've seen the second line, you'll see that this is a much more constrained, simplistic world. And so uh, we set this up for a demonstration a few weeks ago. I really am wrong here. George is not at the meeting. He's back on the East Coast. Yeah. Let's see if I can get it. And so you can see my avatar is a very simple avatar. Can I even move right now? Let's see. Oh, yes, there we go. All right, so here we are. And here's George. And we can turn around. Oh, I move sideways. Uh, and so, I managed to turn off the arrow keys. This is the other thing about these worlds, is trying to come to grips with the command keys, mouse key equivalents, is, is you have to spend a lot of time getting used to it, uh, to, be, to become facile and really make you good use of it. So, um, let's see if this will work. Okay, so here we have, this is actually a PDF file that I dropped on this window, uh, and, and then uh, co-op forums will allow me to display the PDF on the wall. And so, uh, and it's actually running, um, look up a little bit, it's actually running um, the PDF inside of, Uh, it's running the PDF inside of Firefox. So the interesting thing about COG Forums is that they, uh, they run uh, remote applications on a server so they can invoke uh, Firefox to be running remotely and put the display on the wall here. And so we can interact with this. Um, and so I'm just moving the scroll bar right now. And I could go up, if I could move my eyes so I can look up a little bit. Okay, there's, I can actually go here, instead of looking at this document anymore, anymore I can say www.internet2.edu, hit return, and there's the website coming up. And so, and, and I can go, go over here and I can click on the four member meeting. And uh, so, off it goes. And, and we're, uh, Britain, uh, George is in the same area. He can he can also he can also do this. Yes. Way. So actually, let me try and get George back. Next chat. <laughs> there. Is that George? Oh, Jim's arrived as well. So Jim Moran is in the back of the room. He's just arrived. <laughs> uh, let's go to the word. I'm tight. So over here is Microsoft Word. Well, no, sorry, OpenOffice Word. So again, they're able to fire, invoke on these uh, on a Linux server. At, uh, this is a version of uh, this is actually OpenOffice running, and you can just take an OpenOffice document, an Excel document, a PowerPoint, or a Word document, drop it into the window, and it appears on the wall. You can resize it, and uh, and then you can all you can all edit it. So. Yeah, well, we are in the demo. Maybe. Oh, somebody else grabbed the cursor. Now, this is the other thing. It's, 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 com it's uh, yeah, combat editing here, I think. Yeah. So, so um, what else can I say about this? You can build much more complex. This is a very simple room that we set up a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to move around uh, if I can. Uh, so you can have things on the wall. Um, these are two photos. One of them is from George. He dragged and dropped a photo in the, in the uh, into his window. This is a picture of Naples that he took at sunset. And this is on the right hand side. This is a picture that I took when we arrived at San Diego Airport. There were these beautiful paper um, uh, models of. of Famous air, 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 air pioneers, all made out of layers of paper. And, uh, it, it's a pretty cool one. Anyway, so we don't need to see much. But you can do it. I have a question. Yes. How do you um, how do you initiate uh, with a group? How do you get people to be part of 
Okay, okay. So you send them a URL or no? So you actually have to you install you install Quark forums and then you I have administrator rights and I was able to add users, my own users, and, and permit them explicitly to this Merit Flamingo room. And so let's. Uh, and so the other thing we can do is go through, there's a portal door. Uh, so let's do that. And so this is actually how you can link different worlds together. And you can send URLs of these, of these different worlds. Maybe. It says it's a link up here. <laughs> well, there is another world on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I could do this. Yeah. Oh wow! Well. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, you try and open the door. Is it like right click I don't know. I can't remember. I thought we established credentials and most. Yeah, we back. did. And George and I were going through this about half an hour ago. So we have a nice open air garden outside. Okay. Oh well. Let's, are we, is it really 116? <laughs> okay, so, uh, let's, 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 to a second life. Flying windows. Oh, there's, there's a bug flying around the room. We added a bug. <laughs> Let's go to the second line. Uh, okay, so I just have to catch it. Uh, it looks like I, I logged out. Oh, it logged me out. Can I log in? That's the good point. Well, and while you're logging in, yeah. what I might what I might just comment is the point is is that there is a learning curve. I will use myself as an example of a generation that didn't grow up with computers and any were I, did I who had children I hadn't, but if I did, they would be completely fluent in this. Mm -hmm. And I applaud this group's interest in saying, how can we help educators bridge that gap when this is the world that the kids are living in, but we're the world that still wants to teach them and we don't want to lose that that knowledge gap because we don't know the tools. At, or at the very least, let's be in here for a while and evaluate where we think it makes sense to use it for educational purposes and where not. Right. right. It, it really takes a while to get to a level of uh, uh, fluency, as it were, uh, in terms of just being able to maneuver around. And so, so I'm logging in now. My, my online character is Laurie Boom. You're allowed a certain number of surnames, and so I uh, did a variation of my first name, uh, spelling it differently. And so here I am in Second Life. I'm actually just going to teleport over to where George should be. So where are you going? Uh, we're going to go to Edu Island, maybe. And again, uh, is Edu Island one of the by the way, when we get our own space in Second Life, can we also get the Internet 2 shirts that you that yeah. Lori yeah, George, 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 George would happily. He <laughs> got, he Logo did. wear all around. I'm George, sure has, George has all the... Um, I will absolutely make sure that yeah. 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 So, Emily, so you got that now? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so I must admit, I got into a point where I, uh, some, you have to be careful, I would met somebody and they thought, they were said, oh, you're a newcomer, uh, let me give you this outfit, this, this clothing and, and a new skin. And I put it on and I ended up with gray skin, skin tight clothes, and it took me like an hour to figure out how to reset all my, uh, my appearance. And so, I mean, this, this is the thing that people do. I mean, you can imagine teenagers and kids just going crazy. I can click on this, I can go to appearance. And now I go into editing appearance mode. Now look at what I can do to, to myself here. So if somebody is asking to be a friend of mine, I'm going to decline. Right here. Oh, was that you? That's Pat. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, I want to be okay. your friend. Sorry, we'll try again. I'll, I'll, I'll accept you this time. You don't time. like me? I do. 
So, but look at what you can do. You can change everything about yourself, and it is scary. Uh, and you can imagine, people, and then you can, and this is just the default set of clothes and, and appearances. Then you can buy tattoos, you can buy any kind of clothes you want, and spending your Linda dollars, your hard-earned Linda dollars. Well, we'll give you logo wear. So anyway, so let's let's get out. Two ambassadors. Okay, so here we are. Um, I know we are. Yes. Okay. Um, so as as you can see, it's a fairly rich world compared to the other one we're in. And things become clear as you walk around. The other thing is, is you can fly. And so now you can, now you can, now you're up in the air. So Jim, I don't know whether you're following me, but yeah, I'm trying to find it. Oh, 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 okay. Or George, I know where the George is. So here's a volcano. And we see Edu Island. Yeah, that's it. Edu Island. So. So everything is a sort of a gray mist until you get close by, and then things form. Um, so I, you know, it's I, just like real life. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it all depends where you were, how much you had to drink the night before. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I, I think I've probably lost.